Welcome once again to Rhetoric Warriors, the podcast. We're out here fighting words with words, words v. words. That's the game. I'm Dr. Dan, PhD in rhetoric, late night comedy writer from Hollywood, rhetor rhetorician comedian, founder of Rhetoric Warriors, got a new book out, 21 Coliseums of Persuasion. Check that action. Here on the podcast, I talk to comedians about their politics. I convert conservatives because they, because they scare me. And uh, I talk to persuasion pros, cause havers, and rhetoricians. More rhetoricians on this podcast than any other podcast you will ever hear today. Promise. Uh, this is another episode of Persuasion Pros, where I go and find people who are doing interesting stuff out in the world that has to do with converting people with words in public. And uh, we talk to them, and they teach us some cool stuff. Um, I guess this week uh, works in one of my favorite rhetorical arenas, narrative, also known as story, or if you want to get Greeky, mythos. He's a writer, storyteller, story coach, has his own training biz, The Story Source, uh, where he works with corporate execs, does corporate trainings, and will just teach anybody who wants to know something about story. He's also worked as a story coach at the award-winning nonprofit, The Moth. He trained in improv at UCB. This guy's done everything. Uh, he went to Berkeley. Now he's based in Brooklyn. Welcome, Andrew Linderman. Good to be here from uh, yet another B location. That's you. You uh, are, uh, yeah, you're the bees. I'm, I'm, I'm being present, you know, I'm just being being with it. Brooklyn, huh? How long have you been in Brooklyn? Oh, it feels like about 10,000 years, um, but 12, 12 uh, calendar years. 12 oh, and change at this point. Although <laughs> I've been in this apartment now for the last 15 months, talking the talk and uh, actually not walking the walk, literally walking from one end of my 300 square foot apartment to the other. So have that's, you seen, that's have you cool. seen Bo Burnham, Burnham's uh, special? I was watching it. I was started watching it. I love it. It's great. great. Yeah, it's really, I had really this, well done. Um, is this heaven or white girl Instagram <laughs> in my head? And I was like, white girl Instagram. Yeah, talk um, about a so guy, good. you know, turning uh, the space into a asset. You know, just the claustrophobia of that. And that's still- Oh my God. It was just great. Yeah, it's- um. Yeah, I've called this place my cell. Um, I have a little chin up bar that I used <laughs> about twice. Does that teach um, you how to keep your chin up? Is that what it is? <laughs> is it a yeah, that's my, literal uh, or is it a metaphorical chin up bar? It, it's a literal chin up bar, although pull up pull up bar would be more apt because I'm having to pull myself up by whatever is left of my bootstraps. <laughs> uh, these, these days it's my comfy slippers that I have to pull myself up by. Nice. Uh, it's a it's a hard life, you know, this remote living. Um, but yeah, my I inherited it. I and I don't mean to get too off topic from my downstairs neighbor who moved to Mexico. And then uh, the first day I was using it, I hyperextended my back, and it's been all uh, I wouldn't even say downhill from here, but all like optics from here. So it's it. It inspires yeah, yeah. me to be a better person, even when I have no desire to actually be a better person. And taunts you with the person you could be. If. It does. I'm like, I could be stronger if I cared more about being strong. Yeah, all the things. So isn't that, isn't that, isn't that the world? Yes. So run your background for us, man. Let everybody know uh, the basics of who you are and what you're about. Cool. Um, so I, uh, first off, thank you for that very thoughtful, uh, pretty comprehensive introduction I gave you a run through uh, so yeah you give me a run through uh, not a, a partial run down not run over uh but i run a company speaking of running called the story source that is based here in brooklyn but i work all over the world now it's based wherever i have a decent wi-fi connection uh that helps people uncover shape and share their stories more powerfully so in lots of different formats some of it is coaching. So I work with a lot of people uh, individually to help them prep for interviews, to help them work on resumes, bios, cover letters, uh, pitch their ideas, products, services, companies. A communication uh, improver. You yeah, improve the communications. If you don't talk so good, I help you and why you don't talk good and then talk gooder. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of gooder talking. I gooder done. Um, that game. I understand that game. 
you understand that game. Uh, so I do that for individuals with people kind of cross industries, really at all stages of their careers. A lot of, a lot of mid-career folks, because they tend to be the ones who are most paranoid about moving up uh, or, or having other people move up ahead of them. People at the, the beginnings and at the ends tend to want a little broader perspective, but I help them with that. And then I work for organizations. So I do a lot of training and development, I'm doing some work next week, I was on a call earlier today uh, with uh, for the uh, Fordham MBA program, helping them shape their pitches for prep that, or for conversations that they're gonna have with potential employers, a lot of different places, but I've worked with Google, for marketing teams, with design teams, with engineering teams, and then with leaders to help them communicate with each other, communicate with their sometimes shareholders, sometimes kind of broader customer base and audience. Uh, and then I run- Do you find that people want you to dial in like to, so like your big flash word, and I love the word story. I think it's a culture oh, yeah. good. It's, 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 it's a, it's a you know, people love that word. And is oh, that yeah. your entree, the, the story expertise? Well, that's a good question. Um, so I, different, it's very buzzy these days, the word story. Um, yeah. And lots of guys are out there trying to do a sell marketing based oh, on yeah. I mean, the hero's everybody, journey. Every, every third schmuck is a storyteller. Um, but the, my, access point to narrative to story is through the moth as you mentioned so through personal narrative and I was a performer well I was an economist when I kind of came up through school failed out of a bunch of different jobs not for me uh entered the world of comedy like many other sort of misfit sad uh disoriented people discovered that it's less about ego satisfaction and more about the performance and, and the delivery of experience, but kind of learned that the hard way. But my entry point to it was uh, telling my own story and helping other people find access points to telling their own story, both in uncovering moments that are significant to them and then connecting those in a, in a narrative frame. So with a sort of chronology of some sort. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to don't pay attention to me. I'm just, I like to interrupt to get things that I find. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's okay. So like, um, I'm about it. I'm, I can barely pay attention because I have a window unit with an AC. So I'm just going to be fading in and out here. <laughs> and so I'm I, not in the room. In the, I'm, pretty the AC meta, room. I'm pretty meta and abstract. Right. But I also know, like you're saying, like when you get in front of people, they want you yes. to deliver an experience. So give us a little bit, give us one story point from your own personal story, like just a piece that you know always hits. Like it's one of your assets that you know you've got in your bag. Oh, you mean like a piece of the narrative that I, that I yeah, tell? Yeah, about you, you know, because nobody knows you on this well, podcast. Every I barely time people, know you. Yeah, you barely know me. Every time I say the New York Times, people typically go, whoa, unless they are, they believe the New York Times is totally fake news, in which case they go, oh. oh so, okay. but usually I don't end up, it's, I, I'm not getting that deep into it with people who are believing in, in the fake news that the fake media sure. uh, pushes out. Well, the story point is you were, in, you were covered by the New York Times? I was covered by the New York Times early, fairly early on in the business. I uh, was, was got a, a write up about the power of story in the business world. And this is, you know, storytelling is as old as, I mean, you said mythos, right? It's as old as human communication, understanding the through line of experience and being able to make meaning out of it, uh, to call certain things, to elevate other things. So nothing really surprising there, but the appropriation of it for selling shit <laughs> and for yeah, making right. money in a capitalist superstructure uh, is as old as, you know, maybe mercantilism, but you could say through the, the advertising age into our social media dystopia that we're existing in. Uh, so, but this is, this is kind of a more specific targeted approach oriented around helping people find some self-expression and connect personal experience to professional ambition, uh, which I think was, uh, I, I guess the, the real origin for that, uh, not necessarily from a story perspective in terms of what hits and what doesn't, is it never, when I was kind of coming up, it never made sense that 
uh, what I did during my day was not who I am, how I identify. It just uh, like the idea of going into an office and identifying a certain way with a certain title, uh, but then having people use the verb to be uh, in identifying themselves was very odd, right? That they would say, I am a fill in the blank. And I kept sort of cycling through all these different titles and things that like what were your titles? So what, what were your Oh, I was a I was a you know, I was like, I'm an economist. And I was like, am I though? I do some of this stuff, but what what is an economist if in in the essence of it? And then I was like, I don't know if I'm an economist. Then I said, well, was I, am I a comedian? And I was like, well, I really don't do that much comedy. I do some comedy. I perform sometimes. But there are people who are, are that comedian with a capital you know, yeah. C. Yeah they, yeah, they can't turn it off. If they do, there's nothing there. Right, <laughs> exactly. There's Because they're, they're hollow shells uh, of people. And then I thought, well, Am I a storyteller? And I was like, well, that seems apt, right? I've been told that I do that. I have did that at the Moth, did that really with economics, helping people find the through line of uh, data and regress that to try to predict what was going to come out on the other side of that uh, and come up with policy recommendations, come up with you know, in my case, damage analysis. So it was- that's, a, that's an unholy marriage, right? That's come about, like you mentioned it, you know, when you started into this about mercantilism and mm -hmm. the merger of personal narrative and capitalist needs for Absolutely. faux narrative in order to create emotional attachment to sell things. Yeah, and I think, but what I, what I realized is that as disempowering as it was, or as disempowering as I felt it to be at that time, it could actually be as empowering, right? Because I was the one who made that mean something. And by that notion, I could reconstruct that meaning and then reimagine it. Uh, so it got me thinking about the essence of economics, which is really values. Uh, and we think of economics in terms of the exchange of goods and services that have a value placed on them. Uh, I buy some, I buy that shirt from you. And you're like, it's not for sale. And I'm like, I'm going to give you a million crypto. And you're like, okay, I'm naked on a podcast because this guy's going to sell that thing. But we're, if you take it beyond its transactional, uh, the sort of surface level understanding, what is the value that is embedded in a product, a service, an idea? And it's really who we are, how the meaning we ascribe to it. Uh, and where it, how we identify with it, where we place it in terms of our own personal story and the arc of our lives. So the intersection of those things started to fascinate me. And then I, when I went to acting school and started putting on different persona, personae, I guess, if we're going back to the Latin, personas, whatever, you get the idea. Yeah, Masks. Perso per yeah personistas, I don't know what it is. Personistas, yeah, yeah, there you go. Uh, I started to realize that in order to play a character, you have to be a character. You have to sort of find the truth within that facade, within that shell, and then play that truthfully. And that if you play it truthfully, it doesn't guarantee, but it does that other people will resonate with it, but it does generally set you up for a more successful outcome. And if you, they don't resonate with it, it's true enough. Right? So if you're playing economist right now, <laughs> uh, and I were interviewing you on a podcast, you know, what, what, what would be the difference? Like, how would you have dressed? What, well, what would you have been? How would you be? Yeah. I would say um, I would probably would either not be wearing Warby Parker glasses or I would be talking a lot more about them. Uh, <laughs> uh, what else would I be doing? I don't know. Economists have become, they, they when I was coming up, they were sort of nerdy. And there was an, I mean, they are still sort of nerdy. But there was an association of them as being, well, like I got the I got the white dude part down, right? Um, well, like Greenspan, you know, when he was popping into the you know media every once in a while, like yeah. anybody at the Fed, right? They have to play some well, kind of a character. They do, they do, and it's I think, I mean, I mean, this gets into a much bigger conversation about 
the the performance of identity uh, and and what people look like and what they imagine they look like and how we're having to like reconstruct all of that what the president looks like and all but well, yeah take, right but i mean i'm watching it right now so you're seeing all the transition people come in yeah. from the biden administration like merrick garland mm -hmm. right we we've, we've seen bill barr we've seen uh whatever that midget jeff guy uh, from alabama we've seen we've seen the nefarious oh, yeah, yeah. the nefarious attorney generals and then before that we saw Obama's uh, and what's his name? And he was pretty hardcore, uh -huh. um, but seemed like a nice guy. But now Merrick Garland came in and he seems so like at this point, still so soft. Like I sent a tweet out yesterday, like, man, he's he's a real firebrand, isn't he? Well, like, I mean, he, he's not blowing is, it up the way we're his used name to is seeing. Merrick Garland, right? <laughs> when you think about the, just the word Garland, it's a garland of flowers, right? Yeah. Or it's something that garnishes. It's something that that beautifies. It's not something that takes down. Uh, but if you look at it, I mean, and I just know this from the New York Times, if you look at what he did, he's, he's better positioned to take down agents of hate speech uh, and, and treason than probably any other attorney out there. Like that was what he made his name doing. So the fact that he was brought on as the attorney general just as we're attempting to prosecute all of these uh, seditious actors is straight, like eerily coincidental, but also that he would have this name, like Merrick Garland, speaking of rhetoric, right? And the association sure. that would make him seem soft is in some ways perfect, right? Because what we need at this time, somebody like Joe Biden who looks soft, he looks like a fucking grandpa, but Joe Biden, is I mean he's he's like Uncle Joe who was ready to go to the mat with Trump. He was you know the Onion had a funny thing I don't know if you remember like of him polishing his Pontiac on the the White House lawn like shirtless. That was the whole thing. Yeah, like, yeah. But that was the art the association of well Joe and you're Biden. seeing it right. That's the interesting thing. Like I said, this uh, this arena of narrative and rhetoric fascinates me because people don't really realize the full infrastructure that's going on around them with story all the time. And so yeah. like with the January 6th thing, like if it's an insurrection, it's this story. If it's a protest that got a little out of hand, it's this story. And all the characters have to be slotted and fought over until they're agreed on what the character is. 100%. And Garland is kind of, you know what I mean? Like he could have come in as the Avenger, like I'm going to burn all these guys. Well, part of it is he, there, the investigation's not done and they don't want to, they don't want to sort of announce that they're going to put all of these people away for a long time if they can't actually do it. And I think what's odd, is th and this is kind of the same thing that Biden is up against, is that he came up during a slower media time when you could be more methodical and then you would have a big, you'd, you'd drop a big report, you'd make a bunch of big arrests and the news media would kind of follow that and there would be follow-up stories and you would effectively have people's attention for a stretch of time. Now that shit doesn't matter. It's like, We've got just cascading catastrophes. I'm just, like reading the news today. Fucking Germany's underwater. California's on fire. Uh, the lightning strikes over here for the last three weeks as the, somebody takes a jet ski and you know flies around the Bronx. But let's it's, look at that from a story, right? The problem with climate yeah. change as a story is there's no central character. There's no central villain. Well, that, it's I think, all of humanity. No, 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 no. I don't think that's the, the problem. The problem is that the heroes are the villains. That this is a tragic comedy. It's not a comedy, and it's not a, a tragedy. It's that we are the agents of our own destruction, and that's very hard to see. It's hard right. for so, right. It's a complicated. Head. It's a complicated hero villain story, right? We're, Everybody yeah, keeps trying to put the Republicans in as the villains or corporations in as the villains or climate deniers. But climate well, deniers didn't cause climate change. They're just preventing it maybe from being addressed. And I think this is this is both the amazing and the sick thing about the truth is that we are the problem, but we are also the solution. But we don't know which one we are at any given we're time. We're both. Like 
We are clearly both. going to be both. We are not going to stop affecting the planet, you know. Right. So we're always going to be partially the villain. Right. We're definitely and, like and, I think you know, like recycling, right? You know, to take your stuff out to the curb made you feel like a little bit of a hero. And I think you know a lot of the work that I do is about helping people understand that you know they're you're the hero in some stories, you're the villain in others, you're a flat character and you're a background character in other people's stories. But if you can understand that there are lots of different roles that you play, then you can choose the one that, you, that is gonna best serve you in an honest and authentic way at any, at any juncture. Uh, and that's, that's about as much agency and power as you can exert in this, you know, uh, uh, overdetermined universe that we've created. I think that is one of the cool offers in what you do is that when people start to see the, the mechanics of story building to take some control over it. And it's not instant one-to-one -one where I decide I'm the hero, ergo now I feel like the hero, but at least you see a, a path towards that heroism and you, you can be like, okay, I need to do these things to qualify as the hero. Yeah, and I, I like to think of it not so much in terms of control, because we don't have any control over anything, but you do have agency. And if you can understand your own agency, that then you can see yourself outside of yourself and you can cultivate a certain self-awareness. And with Talk that about that. What do you mean the difference between agency and control then? Like, what do you mean? So control is an attempt to uh, determine circumstances. Which is to, what rhetoricians want. I want, right. I want control. But agency is the understanding of your place in a bigger ecosystem and your ability to affect circumstance, but not determine them. I could tell you a joke and I have no idea if you're going to laugh because I have no idea what's actually going on in your brain. That said, I have agency over it. I understand the structure of a joke. I understand the reversal of expectation, set up punchline. I understand uh, taboo topics. I understand uh, our temp temporality. There's all of the mechanics of it, but I can't, I, I can't know. But I can also guide you down a path that will deliver a certain result or experience that I believe to be true. And then if you see it, there's a symmetry that happens. And then it seems as though I control it, but I don't really. So, so you're kind of like talking different between like really high agency where I control most of this versus really yeah. low agency well, and I control almost nothing. Sure, sure. I mean, it's, I don't want to get too tripped up in agency versus control in a functional sense. Yeah, but I just you think can, it's a really useful way for people to, th people to think about story and placing themselves in it, you know? I think so. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you're, you have kids, right? I do. And uh you also uh have have people in your life and you say and do certain things and you know sometimes they backfire all as a function of nothing other than circumstance right you have an amazing dinner that you have planned for somebody you care about and on, and then they have a shitty day and they they yell at you as soon as you they get home right and you have no i they haven't shared why it is that they've had a shitty day but in your mind, you've constructed a whole narrative of how the, the evening might go, and then it's, go, it's thrown out the window. But if you were to overdetermine that, right, you're still attached to an old narrative. There's expectation and then suffering is an extension of that expectation that's embedded into it. But if you have agency that you can go, all right, well, what is it that I care about as opposed to what do I need to do? So there's less pressure. Yeah, I agree. But yeah, again, like anyway, this is no, no, no. We're this is so. This is also, I think, one of the interesting things when you work in story as a rhetorician. Rhetoric is high control, high agency, control everything I possibly can, do the most I can to be successful. Yeah. And storytelling and expressiveness sometimes is tell it the most authentically, the way you feel it, express it for real, find your truth. And you you see these kind of worldviews sort of they can blend in a lot of ways, but they also fight each other. Well, yeah. that's the beauty of it. That's, that's, I, I actually don't see it as, as, I mean, it, I guess it's confrontational in a certain way, but that's the opportunity is that 
there's, you never reach that truth with a capital T. You never get to the end goal. You always approximate it. It's, it's like, if you listen to interviews with songwriters, with famous directors, and these are like movies or albums that have gone triple platinum or have been insanely successful, they'll look at all of these different scenes and go, oh, there's, I missed, there's a, there's a miscue there. There's a thing yeah, yeah. there. Yeah, they're and very, most people yeah. go, ah, I don't, you know, like, I guess I see it. I, or, or what they might say is that was a really brilliant performance and other people have no context for it. But it might've turned out that, you know, I was watching Heat recently and there's a, a amazing movie, like just on so many levels very tense but also you don't even realize it's three hours long uh, my sister's boyfriend is a huge heat fan big michael mann guy and there's a scene with robert de niro and al pacino and the scene is totally unnecessary it's like they just talk they it's just them i don't know if you remember they're sitting at a diner just basically laying out the circumstances yeah, yeah, for yeah, what yeah. they're going to do to beat each other and it's like it could have gotten cut but you can tell that everybody's having fun with it. And it doesn't, does it serve the story? I don't know. But does it serve the experience? A hundred percent. Sure. So I yeah. guess maybe from there, that like, from a rhetorical perspective, we don't need it, right? But, but if you're offering a, people, you're also, you know, it's rhetoric isn't just, it's, it's giving people the experience you want them to have. And if that endears them to the, like just getting to hang out with these great actors, then yeah, totally. you've definitely offered something of value in that choice. And I think what's so cool is that once you understand your own agency and that you can affect things, but you can't determine them, then you can have fun. Then you can go, all right, it becomes uh, just a, a, a slight turning of the screw or loosening of the screw, right? To get a variation of that experience. Yeah, it's funny. So I, I sell the exact I sell the exact opposite offer. Like I'm like <laughs> I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna keep training it. you until you get to the point where you have so much mastery of this that basically you're determining the outcome. So I it's I think what's interesting is it mm, it kind of comes down to your relationship with control and your relationship with relinquishing control. And I've seen, and it's interesting, and this is such a great conversation to have with somebody who does comedy, because there's so many different comedians and so many different styles. And some people are really like super tight with their, the jokes that they write, with the performance, and it's masterful um, in its own way. But if things go awry, th those performances are a mess. You see those those comedians yeah. doing warm-ups and they're having a terrible time. And to my mind, they've overdetermined it. For them, that's just practice to get the precise thing that they need. And then there are people who go to the opposite spectrum where they don't they don't sort of rehearse all of the stuff as much, but they believe that they can yes and their way into finding the fun. And I think the work that I do is a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. It's helping people understand that they can, that they have agency, but they can also have flexibility. Well, I think you even said it there, like, yes, and is agency. It's a tool. It's a mechanism you can be taught. And once you've got that, then you're not just hoping that you can get to a good place. You've got some actual technology that will get you to a good place. Just rely on that technology. Yeah. And it's something that people know intuitively, but then they forget. It's, and we're, we're sort of taught it at an early age when you fall down and you get up again. And even the act of getting up and trying something again is insane, right? It's just, if you are as a child walking along and you trip and you, you scrape yourself, everything in your being is telling you not to do it again. But the benefit of our underdeveloped brain is that you don't actually register it that much. So you just do it again until something very dramatic happens and then you register it in a different way. So, interesting. so it's like, exactly. like, talk to me, like, let's, let's see if we can get less, me and you, less technicians, mm -hmm. 
because I think we're both yeah, technicians yeah. about this. It's funny. Sure, yeah, sure, sure. So going to someone like you, you must have heard lots and lots of moth stories and personal stories. And we talked about this a little bit, like the emotionality and the yeah. the depth that people go to when they start telling personal stories is just incredible. Well, it is, it is. But I think what ends up happening is there's <clears throat> there's fear that comes at the end where people want to wrap something up neatly and they want people to understand that they're okay based on this kind of vulnerable thing that they've exposed. And then what they end up doing is they end up sort of, it falls into one of two camps, right? They either go over the top and they come up with some ludicrous and inappropriate conclusion that's ham-fisted and is this like telling not showing, or they downplay it to the point where you go, that was the point of the story? Uh, yeah. Uh, as opposed to taking a beat and allowing themselves to really find the organic end of the story. Uh, that's what I what's, discovered in working with people. What's one you remember? Like, tell me some, like a oh, couple cool. examples or something. So the story that I remember head. when I worked with the moth, this is an amazing story. There was this kid who was kind of, he's sort of like a low, a low status high schooler. This was out in, uh, in East New York. So really kind of rough neighborhood and sort of a chubby Latino kid with glasses. And he said that he had a story to tell me. And I was like, okay. And he said that when he was, um, he was a little bit younger. I think he, he was maybe 15 or 16 at the time. He would go every weekend to this mall, like the Kings County Plaza or the Kings Plaza Mall and would go to Starbucks and get this venti frappuccino with his brother. And he would do this like week in, week out. And he said that one time he was coming back and he noticed when he walked into the little uh, kind of not plaza, but the uh, garden area in front of his building, because he lived in a high rise building, he saw this kind of funny character uh, who was sort of eyeing him and his brother. And he said that he walked into the building, got into the elevator and the guy held the, the door open and forced him and his brother inside and he pulled out a gun and his brother started to freak out. He was, he was crying and the guy was threatening him and, he, and this kid was just silent. And they went up in the elevator and they got to, the, to the, the, the door opens and he doesn't know what he's gonna do. He doesn't know if he's gonna shoot the guy or what's gonna happen. So he walks them down the hall and he has them open the apartment door and He's sitting there with his brother and the guy just robs the place. He takes the TV, he rips all the valuables out and they're watching this together. And finally he takes all of the shit that he can carry and he runs out and he threatens the, the kid if you know if he's gonna shoot him, do something at the end. And his brother is just hysterical and he's totally silent. And he said that he looked down at his drink his coffee drink and he could see that it had melted completely and it literally as i'm saying this i'm like and then he said that he felt it was the first time ever that he didn't want a frappuccino he just like totally disgusted and when he first told the story i was like wow that's powerful but then i thought no there's more to this and i said well did you go back and he goes, oh yeah, I went back the next week and I just kept drinking the Frappuccinos. And I was like, oh, that's hilarious. Because now we know who you are, right? That you're the type of person who will go back again and again and again in spite of people holding you up and that you love these Frappuccinos so much that nothing can stop you. And he told that story in front of a huge crowd of people and everybody was there watching him with the beads of sweat from his frappuccino on a hot day, they were disgusted by the fact that he'd just been robbed. And then when he told them that he went back the next week, 
they erupted in laughter. And I, I could see that when he walked off stage, they clapped him on the back and they said, that was amazing. And I watched his whole face light up and you could, I, you could see there was a switch that turned yeah. him. Yeah, that's, he, uh, had, yeah that's... He, found, he found the power because he was, he had always thought of himself as the kid who was sitting there with this, this lukewarm sugary drink. But he was the kid who went back right. yeah, after right. somebody robbed yeah, him. You gave him that he last was, character wrinkle. He was yeah. a badass. Yeah. And he, and he didn't even know it. Yeah, that's great. It's There's fucking a guy... amazing. It's fucking amazing. <laughs> like that's the that's the power. And I can't, it's it makes me so happy that all he needed was to find that little thing. And it changed his fucking life. I mean, I've never I haven't seen him since, and maybe. He's gotten robbed again. Maybe he's, you know, everybody has trouble. He's become, right? he's become a, he's, he's starting he's to rob people economist. now. <laughs> he robs, he robs Starbucks and gets free. That would be, that would be amazing. That's um, another good twist. But there's it, a comic, I, there's a comic years ago um, who got kind of famous for doing his moth. His name was Mike DiStefano. I don't know if you remember oh, yeah, this, yeah. this guy. Yeah. I, I knew Mike as a stand up before he went on and, huh? um, just a massive character. I mean, just, oh my God, he'd walk on stage and just say something and, you know, just crush. But I remember when yeah. we went on and did the moth and people were like, oh my God, I never knew this story, you know, of his addictions, like how deeply addicted yeah. he was to heroin and how, you know, what kind of life he had lived. And it took that, you know, massive comedian persona and added this new emotional, you know, texture to it. And it just blew really? him up. Totally. And I think that what I've seen from my, the, the shows that I hosted was comedians didn't know, once they went to that vulnerable personal place, they, they would try to pull it back to this kind of jokey comedy place. And it was very uncomfortable because it was like somebody making a joke about something serious. But the ones who did it successfully were the ones who understood that all you needed was to take a beat and understand what happened a little bit later that gave you the perspective, right? That this kid, this kid was the victim until he went back and got another Frappuccino. And that's, and, and then it's such a small victory and it shows, it tells you who he is fundamentally as a character and it's, yeah. It's hilarious. It, it is fascinating and also to watch, it's like totally cute. like standups. Like you're right, standups control everything. They keep it in a certain wavelength. It usually doesn't go be below a certain range because standup drops out of comedy when you take it down too far into tragedy. <laughs> but like uh, the Comedy Central series, this is not happening. You know where they uh -huh. have standups get up and tell stories instead of doing straight, you know, uh, bits. So they adapt it. So they blend it in with a story. And I've known comics who've gone on there. There's a great uh, comic in New York named Pat Dixon, who uh, just a hardcore writer and just like brutal, brutal in yeah. his comedy. And he told a story about uh, his, this girlfriend he had that tried to kill him. And it, it was hilarious, but just like she got crazier and crazier as a character. And he allowed it to live over there a little bit. And it was kind of fun to watch. And I'll, I'll t I mean, it kind of like some of this stuff stemmed, at least for me on a personal level, from my experience when I did stand up, where I would try all of these jokes. And then the second I dropped the act, people started laughing uproariously. And I, I remember I did one of my first sets. I did, and I think I may have even told you this when we chatted, was I told all these jokes about, I don't know, they were sort of a little contrived, a little forced you know, about what I looked like, the, the problems I was having. And then at the end, everybody was just silent and a couple people shouted some shit. And I said, well, I want to thank everybody. You've been a quiet and respectful audience. And I like that. And just the honesty of that, yeah, yeah, people started sure. laughing. And I was like, oh, all you have to do is just have a conversation with these people. Yeah, I think, I think you hit it with that word, honesty. You know, people react so well to honesty. And I see it again, sort of national politics and stuff like with um, now with like what what blows my mind is people can't read honesty versus dishonesty, right? Like, well, even so like social media on that. Yeah, like even Biden, like you're talking about, like he 
he's pretty clearly telling you real stories from his life. Trump yeah. never tells you real stories from his life. You well, know, and when you hold those up, that I, honesty and that authenticity, for some people, it's like, it's weirdly not perceptible. They can't see it, you know, emanating from somebody. Well, I think the thing, the thing, like when New, when people from New York, they, they hate Trump for reasons that are so much deeper and more personal than the reasons why people elsewhere hate him. Well, they've got like a Trump lot of experience of so hating my, him. My, everybody has in New York, not everybody, but a lot of people have Trump personal stories from Trump, like things that legitimately happen. My old girlfriend used to work at a, a place called the Andaz Hotel. And Trump would go there with Melania when they were first starting, when they were first dating. And she was just standing there and Trump started talking about like her body in front of her and started like telling her what she needed to do and that she was pretty or not. And while Melania was getting a massage and, and like to the point where she was, going to report him to her boss but she couldn't because this is fucking donald trump and this and he ended up walking out and nothing happened and she was in tears and i one of my other this is that's like one <laughs> that's from one it, part you know of that trump there's life. yeah there's i'll tell you there's the podcast to do is just new yorker trump stories just going oh, around, dude. grab everybody's I, story and let's hear what this you know i met a woman i met a woman who is in her, this was probably like four or five years ago. She was she, like a good looking woman, probably like 70s, some, somewhere in there. And this was when Trump is running for office. And I was like, can you believe this guy? And she goes, unfortunately I can. I dated him briefly <laughs> when we were in high school. And I was like, really? And she goes, oh yeah, he was, he's a good looking guy. And uh, you know, Trump, if you see him back then, you know, he's, he's not yeah, a bad looking he's fine. Guy. He's like, yeah, he's, he looks human. Right. And she said, he was, he was a, like a sociopath back then. And also terrible kisser, like just the worst, the worst kisser. And, and would try to get in my pants every time it was pushy. And I'm like, yeah, that's the truth behind this motherfucker is that he's people know and then when he he ran for office and everyone's like oh he's a successful businessman people were just in shock well there's and then the when story he thing elected, again right like the fact that you know the apprentice was so good at constructing a story and a character and this is the yeah. thing about like narrative that's the scary part of narrative is that we've gotten into a media culture that is so strong and we're so used to it that if it's constructed well within a production environment people believe it well, they believe it, but they, they also believe, you know, because we all there, I think we all do some image burnishing. And I would say sure, if you that's part of life, but there's a big difference in that. Very and, much, you know, very much. That. <laughs> well, it's, and, and it's kind of like with the jokes, right? I could tell uh, the same joke to 15, like to 100 audiences. And if the majority of the audiences chuckle or laugh, then that guy probably got a decent joke, right? It's efficacious. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's a good joke, right? It just means it's effective. Uh, but if you ask people, you know, if you ask a hundred people about me, I'm sure there would be a handful who'd be like, never want to talk to that guy again, fuck him. There would probably be a bunch of people who'd go, yeah, I don't even remember. A few people who'd go, I will. And then, uh, uh, you know, some people who were like, that guy's amazing. But- Right, but then it if, comes, that's why I said like with rhetoric, it becomes- it becomes a battle for the story. Like if we, cause we are not going to accept three stories about you. We're going to accept one story. That's the story that eventually will become the dominant one and which will have the most power. Right. So what is the story I mean, of Andrew, the real story of Andrew Linderman? <laughs> well, what is the real story? I mean, if you, if, if, if I knew then I would, I would be making a lot more money and I'd have a better air conditioner. That's for sure. Um, what is the story? I mean, the story is I come from a family of storytellers and my dad's an attorney. My mom was a VP in marketing for Saatchi and then ran her own business. My sister's a journalist for the AP. Uh, yeah, those are, are some storytellers right there. That's yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the world of narrative and we're, we're, we're old shtetl dweller Jews who got kicked out of a bunch of places and 
the, Jew, the, the Jews in a way, actually in many ways, were had to master the art of storytelling to stay alive. What are you saying? That the Jews have been pushed out of, really? It's shocking, isn't it? Huh. But I mean- I think there was a movie about, about that. You should sing this a little bit, you know. There like... you go. <laughs> but I mean, if you think, not to, not to toot my own horn, but the Hollywood and the, a lot of the narratives that were driven or many of them, at least in the early days, were stories of exile, stories of loss, stories of identity that were told through the lens of the hegemonic power. And all they, they realized that all you needed to do was, was transpose the names of the characters, put them in a slightly new location, and you could illuminate a fundamental truth. Sure. And this is, and this is what people have been realizing for time eternal, right? It's why you can watch a movie in Japanese. It's why you can watch a movie in any language. And if it's told truthfully, you see yourself in it and you see the struggles to attain those hierarchy of needs. Well, it is fascinating. It's kind of circling back around to something you started with about, so there's cultural yeah. storytelling, right? There's the, the town sure. storytellers, there's the, every ethnicities, like there was a, a really Absolutely. interesting thing when I lived in Tampa, the, the old cigar factories, they would actually hire storytellers to sit, uh, and tell stories to the cigar rolling women so that they would you know, be able to focus better. And so uh -huh. you've seen this huge ethnic tradition and personal tradition with narrative. And then it gets moved over into capitalism, which is our media, you know, essentially it's just buying stories from artists Correct. and then making money with them. Uh, and now you're going kind of circling back all the way around and go, let me go back into the capitalist underbelly and sell them some story, you know, uh, software that's more personal, that has more meaning. Well you know, that so the, kind of stuff. It seems like it's rescuing it a little bit with the belly bit, of the beast. A little bit. I mean, I'm no, look, I'm no savior. I need, I'm, I'm in the, the same game, you know, the same bean counting and selling game that all of us are. But my whole thing is that not only is it more authentic, it's also going to be more compelling. Uh, when you are able to make it honest, personal, and specific. That not only are you going to be more self-expressed, you will actually be better at your job. You know, it's like when you watch a movie and you go, wow, that person is the character, for better or worse, for that career. It's compelling, right? And it can become difficult for the, over the course of a person's career if they get attached to one particular character. You know, Mark Marin tells a, a great story about how he saw Al Pacino on Broadway right after Scarface. And he said that he was just kind of playing the Scarface character. And it was confusing because he kept seeing Scarface there. And in some ways, Al Pacino has never really escaped Scarface and he never, but you could say he never really escaped Michael Corleone. But, you know, if, sure. if you have that character, you recognize the very toss there and then it's, it becomes something that you want to buy again and again and again, call it a brand, right? And if you are effectively branded, then for better or worse, people have a sense of you. Well, give uh, us some examples of that. Like, I want to make sure we promote your services here. So yeah. like, how do you bring this into a corporation? Talk about the value of that. Like, what are you, well, I think so what, behind? what I really do is I help people find their personal access points to the organizational story and really what that, find what they love about the work that they do and then elevate that. Because especially in the business space, there's a lot that people don't love about the work that they do. Look, I'm t I would rather be talking to you in person, you know, in your, I, I, this doesn't look like a garage, but wherever or on stage than doing this nonsense where we're socially distanced. But it's... That's, that's kind of what people are attached to. Like that's the thing that they're seeking. So it's, there's a lot that's pulling us away from our organizations. So if you can tap into the thing that you love about the work that you do, you can find the fun in it and elevate the fun. And when people are in that space of fun, they're in that space of yes and, affirming, adding information and delivering experiences that are gonna be resonant. Uh, 
So give me an example of somebody you've worked with. Oh, sales, sales, sales people all the time, right? If they can find their personal connection to a product, a service, and a company, they can bring that, you know, an articulation of the values, the sort of accomplishments and work, and then the vision very succinctly and quickly deliver that and then, you know, connect it to whatever it is that they want somebody to do. Like and, I'm, I'm not only, I'm, I'm uh, started here. Right. I'm now. not only the president, I'm also a member. <laughs> yeah. Well, we joke about that. No, I totally, I get it. I get it. I totally get it. It's compelling. I mean, what is, what sells people a lot when I pitch them on coaching is the fact that I work with a coach and that I'm not the only person who does it. Or I'm sorry, I'm not just a person who sells it. I'm also a person who consumes it. And there's an, there's an honesty to that. But there's also, uh, and there's a relatability. And part of the problem that businesses encounter is a relatability one. You know, we, we, I can't relate to Jeff Bezos on his space flight. I can't relate to Richard Branson as he you know, chugs champagne on his trip to Mars. But there, so it's hard for me to humanize Amazon or Virgin. They're easy targets. Those people are easy villains. Well, and they don't do, and I they, mean, Branson does a lot more than, you know, Bezos does, but Branson build, has built a, you know, a, a social good character. Like he does good things for people. And I'm not even, about I, good things, but Bezos. Forget, about, it. Does, forget about these right? people as, indivi- as humans, right? I'm just talking about them as brands, as personas. Uh, or even somebody like Elon Musk who is, you know, who's a a bloviating tech exec uh, who puts his foot in his mouth all the time. And then, you know, just expounds these, these aphorisms for success. They're, again, they're, they're not people. So they're easy to hate. And they they, they do kind of, and this is the interesting thing about social media. I think it's, and even podcasts and yada, yada, yada is that it, it lets them move back and forth between those worlds where, yeah, Bezos came back from space today and you see a you know, 30, 20 second clip of that on everywhere. Yeah. But then like, like I saw Branson talking afterwards, you know, not, not at the press conference, but like on his social media or whatever. And, and that, I think the story options there become really interesting. Well, it's very sophisticated. I mean, it's, and, and the way they can dance around the truth uh, and you know, what they would say is it's just different perspectives of the same story and you're getting an inside look, but there's, you know, there's a burnishing that goes on of the images of these people. And they also recognize that they need to humanize them, but they need to do it in a performative way. You know, it's performative vulnerability, which I, you know, if we're thinking about even my own personal story is the thing that I initially capitalized on and then realized was there was some inauthenticity there. It's like you can fool some people sometimes you can you can't fool all the people all the time. Yeah, it's interesting like you uh, it's it's sort of the phrase you know you want them you want your client or you want these people if you're in the business to be human but not too human. Right. You know, exactly. We can't, we can't take that full boat humanity you know that goes along with this like we can take a little bit of yeah a little bit of flaw but not not much totally and part of a lot of the work that i do is about helping people understand how to bring that in and where to bring that in where it resonates where it doesn't resonate and how it aligns or doesn't align uh and it's you know as as a good story editor does it's going okay well is you know, obviously details draw attention. So if we highlight this, is this, does this serve the story, the experience that we want to deliver or does it detract from it? Does it pull us away? And that's something that people are not, unless you've cultivated it, don't necessarily have a a good sense of. It's like when I told you the story about the kid, right? The drink becomes very important because it's a, it's a sort of symbolizes his transition and his world part sort of movement through the world. But if it were about something else, and I told you a lot about, you know, not a pumpkin spice latte, one of these Frappuccino things, 
you'd go, the fuck were you to buy? What was right, the point right. of that? So do you consider yourself like, that's one of the interesting things I run into a lot with, I'm a technician, you know, about yeah. language and structures. So like with narratives, I go into the deep tech technician part of it. So like what you're talking about now about like, do you teach people, you know, the performance of it versus the story structure versus how to get into a character authentic authentically? There's so much. The answer you know, is yes. How do you teach all that to the point where they can raise up, you know, all these different elements? I always sometimes think of it like, a, you know, it's like an equalizer on a stereo and you're like, you got to get it yeah. at least high enough to where, you know, and so there's so much there and people often don't realize that about their, their rhetoric or their stories. So it's, it's really a function of what people's goals are. And before I used to think, my whole, my whole purpose is to help you elevate, you know, and learn as much as you can become a master at this. But what I discovered is that from a, from just a logistical standpoint, a lot of people don't, and this kind of saddened me when I first encountered it, they actually don't care that much. And that hurt my heart because I was like, <laughs> how can you not? How can you not? Get into How do you not like word? Walk? Right. Like this is all you have. And then they're like, yeah, I guess. But it's the type of, but also once I let that go, I was like, oh, okay. I don't need to be a dick about this. Right. It's like, if you want a hamburger, you can go to, um, you can, you can go to Le Cirque and get a, well, I don't know if Le Cirque has it. Um, what, what's the one I'm thinking of the Thomas Keller you can get like a $40 hamburger with, you know, artisanal meat and that's, yeah, yeah. that's biodynamic and it's delicious. Or you can get them, you know, a fast food hamburger and fast food hamburgers are fine, right? Like nothing wrong with that. Yeah. The only problem comes when you try to treat them, you, you deal with them on the same level. Yeah, I have to always remind like myself, like with story and even with comedy and things, I'm really hard on stand up. But I've been doing stand up since I was 23 years old. I've oh. seen the best of the best of the best. I've worked with people that are amazing. You can't apply that to somebody who's been doing this for six months. Yeah. You have, to, also, you have to turn that off and say, okay, we're going to give you 4% of this right now. Well, and, and as then, soon as you can handle that, we'll move up to the next 4%. And at a certain point, when you become a professional, you stop going, okay, I love friends. I love Seinfeld. I hate this. And you go, all right, well, forget about that, right? Forget about how good it is in terms of Mount Olympus. Can I create that? Is it, is, does, what is the byproduct of all of this work? You know, where does it work? Where does it not work? And once you, you know, it's like the, the agency thing. Once you get into the, the, the conversation about efficacy, it becomes fun. Cause I'm like, oh, you know, friends, I, I love friends. But I don't love Friends because it has any like deep spiritual significance. I love Friends because it it created a whole genre and it well it transformed the genre of situ certain aspects of situation comedies. But because it's so tight, yeah, yeah, and it's so it's so um, it just works, and it and it was so efficacious. Yeah, it's funny. No, was, was it good for the culture? Was it bad for the culture? Separate conversation. It worked. Yeah, it's interesting when... So respect. Pop culture like that, when something comes together, people have no idea. Like, how many sitcoms have been made oh. versus Friends? So that's 0.0001% exactly. of all sitcoms. It's, all, it's hard. It's also, like, it's hard to make a Big Mac, <laughs> which is a hard... Which is a, a fucked up thing to say because Big Macs are like right, but you couldn't do it. Big. You could not do it. Yeah, I mean it's it's funny when people are you know you see people who are like oh yeah I could make a light bulb I'm like could, you you can't even make a light bulb with the existing technology <laughs> looking it up online, let yeah. alone someone who had no resources who made it from nothing. Yeah, that's a that's a really so, good point. Uh, I think that understanding the manufacture of your stories that, totally. You know, for sure. And you also you also see yourself in the bigger in a bigger picture that it becomes it's no longer about you. 
like you as a, a with a capital Y, but you're you're part of the conversation. And that's for me where the storytelling starts to take on a, a spiritual aspect that I'm a I'm a facilitator in a way. Like one thing that I say all the time is that stories, the stories I tell and help people with are about them in the sense that they are characters in the story, but they exist without them, right? We have a conversation and I tell you some stories and then all of the things I say now belong to you. Not in the sense that they're like trademarked and you can make money off of them, take you to court and then we have a whole issue about it, but they're yours in the sense that you now go and you tell your kids, you tell other people, you talk about them, you write about them, and it's out into the universe. And that's where, that's where the agency and power comes in, that you have affected people simply by existing. But only, yeah. Yeah, it's cool, man. I like it. It's, it's fucking radical. I mean, I love it. Well, awesome, man. Like, uh, I've kept you about an hour, so let's- No, uh... no, I could talk about this for a much longer- uh, yeah, I can tell. Like you, you, you. I think you have a lot to offer. I could definitely see why people would want to bring you in. You have really good technology about this, and still really good. You know, I think um, the sort of artistic touch with story, like what it means, you know, and all those sort of deeper things about story. Yeah. So, pitch yourself, pitch your stuff again uh, here okay. at the end before we get out. And so, if you've if you've gotten this far and you've listened to our conversation and you haven't shut me off, or or Dan off. I don't know why you would. He's he's a he's been a, a, a great banterer host. Um, you can check me out at the Story Source. It's www.thestorysource.org. I have .com too, but I choose .org because I'm an org. Uh, and I help people with interview prep. I've gotten five or six people jobs in the last probably seven or ish months. I help people with resumes. I help people with talks. I have helped people with wedding speeches, I helped an Irish guy give a wedding speech at his brother's uh, wedding in Ireland right before the pandemic went amazingly well. I've helped people uh, get funding for companies. I run trainings. I've worked with Google, Amex, and doing a thing for Fordham MBA. I've helped startups. I've helped nonprofits. And then I run workshops. I've been doing it virtually because that's the world that we live in, but I'm soon going to be doing it in person again. Uh, all of that information is on the website. You can also follow me at the story source on Instagram. Uh, hit me up on LinkedIn. I will respond. We'll have a fun time. We'll chat and tell some stories, help you tell your story more powerfully, maybe get some money, you know, whatever that means in this nonsense superstructure system. But if that's what you want, I'll help you get it. Cool, man. Well, uh, definitely go check out Andrew. Uh, clearly, he's got a lot of stuff to offer. Uh, always fun to bring people on that have, you know, sort of dedicated at least sections of their life to something that I find fascinating, you know, so pretty cool. I love this. This is, this is like, and I genuinely love this kind of thing and talking about this because I think, think it's so fascinating and would talk about it for hours and hours and hours. Uh, yeah, that's, I just got to say. So what a pleasure to be invited on here. What an honor to be able to talk about my experience. It is share. an honor, isn't it? It's an honor. It to is. Be here. So it's much gratitude. I mean, honor. I have so much gratitude just to, you know, and I, I talk shit about social networking and virtual world stuff, but look, lunch club. Yeah. Prop you know, lunch club human connections are human connections, right? You can make the most out of them or you can just breeze right past them. And that's exactly. why when I find somebody, I'm like, oh yeah, that person's doing something I find interesting. I want to talk to him. So this is totally, great. totally. And the world is weird, but if you can figure out how to be weird with the world, the world will be weird with you and you'll all be together. I love it. That's a, right, that, that's, it should have been a Beatles quote, but. That was know. perfect. Yeah, put some lyrics behind <laughs> that and send it to Bo Burns. John Lennon is like, mate. <laughs> cool. Well, uh, I will circle back around. Appreciate it very much. Awesome. This has been the Rhetoric Warriors podcast. Get out there, persuade some people. They need it. Get good at it. See ya.